Good morning, everyone, to our Good Friday virtual bridge number 135 in the series. Still amazed by that. Today we have Fiona McCloy, an instructional design consultant from Ulster University, who's going to share with us her experiences with managing large groups online. Over to you, Fiona. Thank you very much, Noel. Lovely to be here today. So I shall um, just share some slides. To begin. So, um, yes, yeah, so I'm from the Office for Digital Learning at Ulster University, and today I just wanted to share um, some reflections on providing support to academic staff at Ulster University over the last year or so, and with regard to managing large cohorts of students online, and in particular, you know, with regard to teaching, learning, and assessment. And, um, and that support has involved some workshops um, with, within a faculty, um, looking at the large group online, also with looking at large group assessments and the, the unique challenges of that. And then um, and what kind of more tailored one-to-one um, -one support as well, when it kind of gets down to um, really setting up, for example, maybe um, how to do um, group presentations online. So, um, so quite a, a range of things. And it's, it's also been quite mindful of the feedback that we've got from our students and staff as well um, since the um, move to um, more online due to the pandemic response. So just have um, keeping that in mind as well. So yeah, the, the first thing, and it probably seems like quite an obvious thing, but um, if you've got the large cohort to split them into smaller groups, so splitting them into smaller sizes. And um, I think it, it's good if you can do this really quite early on and then have that group consistent throughout the whole period of time of, of the study so that um, to initially um, so that they're getting to know each other, whereas they're then getting the chance to build that on into more um, critical um, thinking and working together. Um, and especially important, um, you know, if it's a first year, or it's an early experience of the course. So the, um, and that could um, lead into assessment and um, as well. The, um, and if it's possible to give each smaller group an area for themselves online, so they've got their own place um, to be meeting, and if they could be doing that independently um, of the, the staff as well, so that they can really have some independence and being able to meet when suits them. Um, and if it's also good if you can then meet them um, in their groups as well um, to sort of you know be able to give them guidance and support. But when it comes to them splitting up those groups, so it's it's probably thinking, well, what size do you make them and, and how do you do it? So it, it probably depends on the size of your, your large cohort um, and then maybe on your staff student ratios as well. But um, Professor Sally Brown had the idea of um, kind of siblings and cousins. And I quite like that idea that it's, it's almost like you're creating this, you know, a family kind of analogy. Um, a support network, but, you know, a smaller, you know, maybe sort of in around two to five of a kind of sibling, um, and then the cousin maybe more um, in around, I don't know, maybe 10 to 20. And, and then if, you know, if they kind of feed, um, you know, and then into the larger group. So for today, just reflecting on that, some aspects to consider um, I think is your learning design. And by that, it's, it's really your learning, teaching and assessment um, design. Um, and then your support and technology. So what you're actually using um, to create those online spaces. And then where are those spaces? What are, where exactly are the learners going to be? Um, and then thinking of the, the context um, which, you know, is always important to think of, but like, is there, um, you know, things like what your movie staff student ratios are, what um, maybe professional requirements there are, um, what maybe the digital skills are of your staff and students. So the kind of things um, to keep in mind. And then also just making very clear expectations for the students, like clear guidelines of what's expected. And if there's an element of co-creation in that, but it's really getting buy-in from the students as to what's expected, what the rationale is, and that there's a clear pathway, um, especially in a large group, it, it can get a little confusing perhaps. So it's just making sure that it's, it's known um, what's expected. 
Okay, so just going to look then at um, some aspects in a bit more detail. So the, the learning design, um, so I've just highlighted six things here, but that um, if it's possible to have regular group activities, and that could be a mixture of live um, synchronous and then also asynchronous, so that there's a mix of that and that it's feeding into each other, um, so to really to sequence the learning and to develop it. Um, and also that could be then the whole group meeting and it could be also be then some activities are this actually the subgroups um, are doing um, different activities. So it could be a mix that way as well. Um, secondly, the high um, or so the live sessions. Um, so I, I think whenever, you know, obviously the time that um, as the staff that you have with the students is just really, really important um, for those live sessions. So um, I think it's worth thinking, well, what is the, the highest value that you can give to your students within that particular time period? So is it, um, you know, maybe thinking about, um, is it revise, going over something again um, that maybe was um, sh shared asynchronously so that you're reviewing something? Is it the chance for question and answers? Um, is it maybe providing feedback to the group or having some sort of feedback discussion? So, um, and then whatever isn't going into the, the high value live, but then that is being um, added um, asynchronously. Um, and then I think the challenge as well with those live sessions with a large group as well is just trying to make them as engaging as possible. And, and there is unique challenges with that with a very large cohort. So maybe some things to think about is that if it's possible to get a colleague to support with that so that um, you're able to maybe that you know one could be focusing perhaps in the chat window um, and the other is more doing the presenting so that you can maybe then um, almost like buddy up um, for that. Um, and then I think just making it clear to the students well, what they what is what the, are the rules you know are they is it best to raise your hand um, and what ways to sort of get engagement you could be using stuff like the polls um, and, and ways to get kind of feedback from everybody um, and also the as far as the the kind of a mix you you know you could be asking questions for them to prepare questions beforehand for example in a discussion board and then you're addressing those specific questions in the live session so that um, whenever everybody's together and then also important to record those sessions and share them so that they're inclusive for those that aren't able to make it um, and then having um, a possible regular checks on the learning and, and providing, um, give an opportunity of some sort of um, feedback dialogue about that. So this is probably using something like the interactive um, polling devices, which works just really well with a large cohort um, so that you're able to be able to get feedback quite easily from everybody. Um, and that's especially in the online context, that's really useful for the, the students to get a sense of where they're at and also for the staff to be able to get a sense where the students are all at as well. So having those regular checks um, and whether it's an interactive um, kind of polling system like Menti or, or, other, or else it could be something like practice tests that are delivered that could be um, more asynchronous as well. Um, and then um, peer support and group work. So a benefit for assessment um, if it's a really large cohort, if you're able to um, develop some sort of group work, it should hopefully make it easier um, so that the students are actually going to be supporting each other and that there is less potential marking as well if there is going to be less, um, you know, if, if they're working in groups. But of course, you know, group work does have its own challenges and, and it's um, just, you know, seeing if that's appropriate. Um, next one, just if there's any other opportunities for the students to connect with each other, I think especially in a large cohort, trying to make those connections and if it's possible that that could be fun and enjoyable that it's um, maybe, you know, bringing them together for a quiz or, or some sort of game um, thing so just the chance to get to know each other. And then um, the final one there is just um, formative assessment and feedback opportunities so there's really um, assessment for learning and that it really means that you're kind of spreading it so that it's not just all happening at one place so that, um, but I'll look at that, I've got a slide just particularly on that. Um, so just looking at the enabling technologies around that. So it's, 
probably worth thinking, well, what's available to, to you to begin with, whether that's supported within your institution or, or non-supported, and thinking through, well, what does that mean? Like, is it a safe, you know, environment or, or is it secure? Will the students feel like they're able to really experiment within it? I'm thinking of, um, you know, with a kind of critical pedagogy lens, and that um, whether they've got the digital skills, well, what digital skills do they have? What digital skills would you like them to have? Um, for example, for the workplace, the kind of mix of formal, informal. And it's always nice if the students can be given some sort of choice around this as well. And But with all of that in mind, probably the key thing is trying to keep it simple so that it doesn't become completely overwhelming and that you're kind of getting lost between a lot of different systems. Um, within the Ulster context, the tools that um, we use um, as far as the supported tools, there is Blackboard, which is our virtual learning environment, and a tool that we've really been recommending um, for the large group um, is the Blackboard Groups tool within Blackboard. It means that each student has their own area. It's that kind of area that they have with, you know, 24 seven. They have access to their own then group discussion board, which they have control of. They've um, control, they've got their own Blackboard Collaborate area. So it basically means they can go and be having a live um, meeting anytime that they want. So it's, it's really um, given them that independence in their learning. Um, so yes, but as I mentioned, Blackboard Collaborate is our, our virtual kind of classroom and that's embedded within um, the Blackboard module areas. And there's also the breakout groups then within Blackboard Collaborate so that in a live session, you can also be splitting up your students um, into groups. Um, we've got Panopto as media platform, which means that we, you know, you can be doing things like group presentations, group um, video submissions, um, group audio submissions, so that, and that integrates with our assessment and feedback um, kind of workflows. Um, and then the interactive polling apps that I mentioned. So we've got some institutional licenses to that. And then Office 365 um, apps. So popular ones such as Teams and, and OneNote, um, Class Notebook for um, an e-portfolio, for example. And then library resources. And then there's some other interactive tools that are, can be quite popular as well, such as Padlet. Um, and th that just gives the students um, that um, opportunity to have interactivity um, as a group as well. So then to think um, sort of a, as far as the learning spaces. So you've obviously got your live sessions, which are your, your timetables, most likely the timetable sessions that you have. Um, and they, you know, we would be using the likes of Blackboard um, Collaborator or whatever, you know, is, is your similar kind of tool. And um, then that group collaboration space, which as I said, that's what we've been using Blackboard groups with, or it could be something like Teams. Um, but that you're able to be there with them if you need to be. Um, so, for example, you could be meeting them within um, a live um, meeting within those their own group collaboration space. And then the other nice thing about that is if they're doing group work within there is that that's visible to you as well. Um, so that you're able to see um, the progress of that. And then those more interactive um, spaces that could be, um, you know, could be a discussion board, you know, something where something can be posted and commented on and that really get a bit of dialogue and discussion happening. So whether that is, um, you know, something like, um, you know, it could be Teams as well um, or it could be Padlet, you know, that kind of thing. And then just that the students are probably organically going to be creating their own spaces anyway, um, especially, you know, if they're working in group work, they're likely, you know, maybe going to set up their own WhatsApp group or, or Facebook. So I suppose it's just being aware of that, that they, you know, have their own spaces that um, you're not going to be having access to. Um, and that's, you know, fine. And then finally, just to look um, specifically at assessment and um, some of the challenges around that. And I think it's, it's worth reflecting on, well, what is the, the pressure point whenever you do have that large cohort and you're looking um, whenever you're um, doing assessment? And is it that there's um, a period of time where you are going to be marking just an awful lot of um, essays, for example? And is that the, the difficult bit? And think about what can be changed or what could be tweaked to make that just maybe, um, you know, what opportunities are there, there to um, maybe make that a little easier? 
And yeah, one thing is to have it continuous, you know, opportunities for drafts, for example, um, to have um, something like a portfolio, an e-portfolio that's more of a continuous um, progress um, showing the, the work of the students. And that it can be authentic. So, you know, does it need to be written? Could it be that it's a media? Is it a video? Um, something that's reflected like a video log? Um, so something that's really, um, you know, able to show the student voice and, and that just might be, um, make it just easy, well, more enjoyable for, for everybody and learning um, skills as you're doing that as well. Um, standardized um, as far as the assessment and feedback, so having um, criteria and, and maybe using a rubric. And we find it also the rubric can be useful, especially for that large class size, because if it's set, if it's shared to begin with, and then it's being used to, um, you know, to give feedback to the students so that you're um, easily able to select within, for example, the assessment tool, what descriptor is, is suitable for that particular piece of work. Well, that means that it can be quite an easy um, way to be able to give really quite rich feedback to individual students um, and as in as easy as in it doesn't take a lot of time to do that because the, the text is already there within the descriptors. Um, the, the regular checks of, of, of progress that we're talking about, whether it's using something like an interactive polling app or something like that, but um, our practice tests, but that that can be set up in advance. Um, it can be reusable year after year if you've got a question bank of multiple choice questions that are given automatic feedback. So that's all feedback that can be um, quite, you know, across the timeline. If it's automatic and given feedback for a correct answer, but feedback for an incorrect answer as well, um, that's pointing them in the right direction. So um, that can all be just ways to be able to get, um, you know, rich feedback um, provided. And, um, you know, it could be reflective. Um, also, you'd be using peer reviews. So when you've got that, you know, your large group of students, that they could be giving each other feedback. So it's not just all from the instructor. So they, um, that could, would be um, something like, you know, students providing feedback to their peers based on criteria. And, um, and then also the group work. So and as I've mentioned, the progress being visible, it could be something like a group presentation. But once again, it's, it's the students working together um, in order to do that. And um, so that's really the um, end of um, my what I had to share. So I'd be um, very happy to take any questions. Okay, just going through the, uh, the chat here, there's been some uh, discussion around um, Discord. I've never heard of that um, application before. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of completely removed from learning technologies these days. Um, does anybody kind of want to come in and, and kind of ask a question around that, um, that platform or those platforms? Kenji, go ahead. <clears throat> so not about Discord, but Discord is a gaming sort of chat environment. Uh, which is was very popular in that community. But um, I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, group work. So that that's a, a, a mode that's obviously been very popular outside of, of the kind of COVID experience. Have you found that group work comes with its challenges, mostly around making sure that everyone is participating, that it's working well? Have you found that during this kind of period that any new approaches have come to light about helping people to just ensure that everyone's collaborating, getting along and work's being done? Yeah, um, I think it's, it's so true that with the group work, it, it can be such a um, kind of scary um, thing for the students and for the staff. And in some ways, it's, a, it's about building the confidence um, with it, I think, um, and, and that it's appropriate so that it's, it's um, building it up from the early levels. So, you know, for um, the first year that you're learning those kind of um, skills that are then developing um, within the years of the, um, so I think it's, it's keeping that in mind and, and making sure that it's, it's well thought through, but the, um, and, and as possible, it's been suggested as well, like a learning contract, you know, with the students so that it's really clear well, what is expected and, um, but I think that's where if you're using, as far as the online context, if you're using something 
Um, th similar to the way we're using the Blackboard Groups tool within um, Blackboard, it means that you're creating a space where you're able to see the discussions, you're able to see what each of the students are contributing. Um, and I know that, that there has been some discussion where even that, um, you know, staff wanting the students to do that, um, you know, that they're, you're able to see the discussions, you're able to um, maybe even be asking them to um, record presentations within their collaborates. So you're, you're getting, or meeting them within there and having regular checks with them. So um, that can then um, hopefully then address any fears as well if you're meeting them regularly. So um, it's thinking about all of those things, I think. Okay, Jason, you've got your hand up. Uh, indeed, and uh, thank you very much for this. This is uh, very dear to my heart because um, I got into the area of ed tech before I happened because I was a lecturer with a 300 student class. And back in the day, and it was a little while ago, um, then it was a case of, well, a couple of lectures a week. I had my experience and expertise. I had a chapter of the textbook um, and um, I had tutorials and I had a few people helping out with those. And the tutorials were read something and then we'd discuss it in the air. Now, we know that uh, planning has come on a long way, but what I'd like to ask about is the perception of burden on staff. Uh, obviously, things have got more sophisticated. And indeed, they've got better. Um, and also the sort of support mechanisms that allow staff to deal with it. Obviously, you're supporting staff with this. Um, but is there a recognition that, um, that if you've got 300 students, it's not just about turning up twice a week and delivering a lecture anymore? Um, yeah, completely. That, um, and, and you can see it's, yeah, it's not just that one point in time. Um, I think whenever you're really trying to make the most of, um, you know, working with a large group, that yeah, there is that asynchronous and um, and that that's all feeding together, so that you're you're really going from um, and yeah, building it up and um, yeah, just trying to yeah make a mix. But I think as long as there's a clear pathway through that, well then yeah. Um, but yeah, it's not just one point in time and it, it can't be. And also even just as far as inclusivity, you know, that if one person then has any technical issues um, in the online environment um, and, and, you know, that you're you're missing out on the key things. So you, you, you want it to be, um, you know, really spread out and, and also making sure, yeah, that there is um, alliances for that, you know, that there's um, things recorded, for example, as well. But yeah, it's, it's um, probably looking at in, the engagement and, and the presence um, across um, all of that. And I think that's another thing as well for the instructor to making sure that they are present and that they are, you know, not just in that one space at one time, but um, in the different discussions. And if they're able to dip into the different subgroups as well, um, and, and that it's clear as well in advance that that's what they're, you know, when they're going to be there, you know, so that it's, it's clear expectations. If you've got a query, I'm going to meet you um, in this, t at this point, and we will, um, you know, chat about that, making the best use of the time that, that you have available with them as well. And can I ask, just following on from that, about the planning time that goes into it, um, I think I've, I've no uh, lecturers who have pretty much changed over the past 30 years, uh, only in the extent that they moved from acetate to PowerPoint to dumping onto the VLE at some point, and uh, there wasn't an awful lot of planning. This must require quite a lot of planning, and also uh, planning the planning, because from year to year, then, this is going to change. Is that, is that right? Um, yeah, and um, I think probably as far as the support, I think, you know, it, it depends on um, the confidence of the staff and it, it probably is um, trying to build up some, you know, taking small steps. Um, as much as that was possible to do in the last year, perhaps not, but um, if, if everything was, if you had the time to really think about it, you would be doing it in, in smaller steps, but the... Um, but yes, that, that um, yeah, a clear thinking about um, what it is. And at, at the end of the day, you want to try and, and make it, um, you know, as, as um, enjoyable, as, as simplistic as you can for the students. So that it's really trying to think, well, what, where is the effort going to and, and making the most of that. But, but yeah, it, um, and yeah, the, the, I guess it's the, the challenge of yeah, where it goes from here as well in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Fiona, Fiona, is there any support in terms of managing the sessions themselves? I mean, because you, you mentioned an instructor, would that be a member of academic staff being the instructor? 
Yeah, um, and that's, you know, was kind of, I suppose we have mentioned that in training and things and in, in the hope that academic teams will kind of get together and see what they can do with that. And I think it depends on the the, the actual circumstances, but it, it could be that, um, you know, that you're, whether it's a buddy up or a, a group that for those live sessions that they're able to say, okay, well, I'll, I'll be there available for an hour in that one if you can and come to mine. And that, so it's, it's sort of not nothing formal in that, or there hasn't been um, um, anyway at this stage. Okay. Um, I'm also kind of curious about, you know, breakout group sizes and, and have you tried to kind of uh, look at different sizes of groups and look at how the dynamic of groups change based on their actual size as well? Has there been any um, work done on that? No, well, I can, not with um, what we have been saying, as I say, apart from that um, kind of family analogy that I kind yeah. of like, but um, I think within um, the, the breakout groups, as far as a live breakout group in Blackboard Collaborate, it always um, sort of feels that in round kind of um, four or five seems like a, a nice number, um, but th that's probably more from just experience of, of trying it that, um, you know, you kind of want it to be small enough that people can feel happy to engage, but but that it's not becomes, um, you know, it's not off-putting. But um, yeah, I guess the smaller, especially in the, a large cohort, the smaller that you can try to make that, and especially if it's more for that social, you know, if it's possible that it is just even buddying up with someone and for, you know, if it's a first year and that, um, you know, that they just have a, even if it's not Thing more than you know than just that initial peer support um you know it's it's um good but of course it all depends on then um the, the overall size of the cohort and the the staff but then um and it's also what you want them to do so if you're then planning it to be more into group work it's going to take more guidance whereas if it's more social well then you can be um, maybe having it more granular so I guess it depends, really. Yeah, I mean, of course, I'm kind of thinking in a live session, you would want to ask a simulated question or series of them and then send them off the breakout rooms, come back maybe 15 minutes later. And, and that way, but group work would take a little bit more time, time and planning um, and, and, and lay out the, the groundwork before you kind of send them away. And it doesn't have to be a breakout room. It could be whenever they want. Yeah, yeah. And, and what can be nice as well, um, if it is talking in the live context of the breakout group, say within collaborator or that type of thing that um, you're giving them, you know, would often use it there then maybe feeding into something like Menti or a Padlet so that you're getting, um, you're almost getting the conversation sort of um, more visible within there as well, if they're able to share something out. And if it's um, a tool that then is, um, you know, they're asynchronously as well. So it means that the discussion doesn't have to stop within that breakout group and that if it links into them whatever next activity that you're doing within their collaboration um, space as well. Um, have you asked the, the students who are participating in these um, for feedback yet? The, well, we did take part in the Digital Experience Insights Survey last semester. So we um, got feedback from students um, and um, academic staff, but it was interesting. We did ask them a question around um, just brings to mind a question around how connected they feel and um, groups came out so strongly like in the word cloud that was like the largest word that came out so um, so there was feedback students that had a space like um, where they were using the blackboard groups and having access to blackboard collaborate themselves were saying I want this in every module you know this is so useful to be able to go in and to be able to use collaborate and meet students when I want to meet them um, so there were things like that's coming through um, you know, and just wanting to be having a um, meeting um, together um, more socially as a group within their module areas was another thing coming um, back that they, um, you know, wanted the time to be able to socialize and, and were happy to do that. Um, so there was, um, yeah, but yeah, lots of um, reference to groups <laughs> and enjoying the group work, you know, that they, they were, that they liked that and were wanting more of it as well. Broke up a, a big long session, yeah. Um, Kenji, you have a question? Um, sorry, yeah, sorry. In in terms of the, the instructional design and planning side of things, for all of these kind of new approaches that you've described, do you have particular templates or frameworks that you provide to staff to help them get started? 
Um, we haven't, nothing of, um, I think it really depends. Um, you know, sometimes we would um, go back to um, things like viewpoints cards that were developed as a just project um, many years ago. Um, so um, and we've recently been looking at the assessment and feedback ones of them in particular, um, and the the planning tools around that, but it, it really depends on the context and, you know, and, and what, um, how much time and, and everything that's available. So unfortunately, we probably didn't have that luxury as much this time around. Um, it was more providing um, workshops where it was um, what's possible, um, getting into the tools quite quickly um, and, and getting the kind of um, capabilities up quite quickly as far as, the, you know, the digital skills. So, um, but yes, ideally, I think that would have more of, of a lead in time. Okay, and I think our 30 minutes are just about up now. So um, for the purposes of the YouTube, um, we bring it to a close. So Fiona, thank you very much for that. Um, that was great. Um, and thank you for watching um, on YouTube. And don't forget, uh, you can register to join these virtual bridge sessions live and free by registering on the College Development Network. So thank you and goodbye. <laughs>